do our best. Thank you. I'm going to start over. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us today to commemorate the 80th anniversary of the murder of James Hatsuwaki Wakasa shot and killed by a guard while out strolling with his dog at the Topaz concentration camp 80 years ago today, on April 11, 1943. My name is Masako Takahashi. I'm the president of the Henry and Tomoe Takahashi Charitable Foundation. We will begin with an indigenous land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we are on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramaytush Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards of this land and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramaytush Ohlone have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place, as well as for all peoples who reside in their traditional territory. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors and relatives of the Ramai Tushalone and affirming their sovereign rights as first peoples. We thank the Association of Ramai Tushalone founder and executive director Jonathan Cordero for this indigenous land acknowledgement. A purification blessing will be offered by Reverend Masato Kawahatsu, senior minister at the San Francisco Konko Church, and Mrs. Allen, Alice Kawahatsu, the pioneer founding minister of the San Francisco Konko Church, was incarcerated at Topaz. Alice Kawahatsu's mother and family were incarcerated in Tule Lake. Good afternoon, everyone. I am uh, Sensei Masato Kawahatsu, uh, Senior Minister of Concord Church of San Francisco, our church uh, corner of the bush and laguna nearby here. Uh, uh, RS, my wife, and I are honored to be uh, asked to offer a purification rite for the 80th anniversary memorial service for the late Mr. James Hatsuaki Wakasa, who was killed at the Topaz relocation camp, and also for all other people who died at the camps and those who fought for freedom and served during World War II. As I started to read and uh, hear more from um, Wakasa Memorial Committee, I started to feel close to Mr. Wakasa. I don't know him at all before, but, uh, and what was the top of the internees had to endure and witness during this sad time. I felt deep connection with him and top of the camps as uh, I learned Mr. Wakasa came from Ishiwa, uh, Ishikawa, Ken, Japan. My father was also born in Ishikawa, Ken, too. I was uh, born in Yamaguchi, Ken, southern part of Japan, the uh, mother uh, boss place. So I don't know anything about my father's side. And uh, yesterday I checked the, uh, where he come from, my father and Wakasa-san. And they are neighbor. Amazing. <laughs> wow, I have connection with <laughs> them. I, in addition, our San Francisco Congo Church first head of minister, Reverend Yoshiaki Fukuda and his family were inter interned at the uh, Topaz camp and they unfortunately lost their 14 years old son while being interned at the relocation camp. Many spirits, I am sure, still feel worry, sadness, or regret at not being able to physically leave the camps and complete their hopes and dreams. 
I hope through this purification service, our purified prayers will bring healing and forgiveness so we can move forward. Let us express to our ancestors who endure so much suffering, feel our care and compassion and love as we express our appreciation for their love and continued guide, guidance and protection. I am sure that they appreciate all of you being here today. Now let us start the purification ceremony. Thank you. Welcome everyone. Um, thank you for coming today. It's a little bit windy today, so we're gonna uh, try to get close together and join with hearts. Um, our Kunko faith tradition starts with um, four claps together, and that symbolizes the working together of all people and Kamisama, God. It also uh, represents all the working together of nature, the, the heavens and the earth, all of our hearts here today. So let me, um, uh, let's lead in a Haide, four solemn claps together. Haide, four solemn claps. Thank you. We'll now have the Norito Sojo, the purification prayer by the head officiant. Uh, please bow our head and let us pray. It is memorial service for the late James Hatsuaki Wakasa and all other Mitama spirits who died at the Topaz as well as all other relocation camps and soldiers. Dear Divine Parents of the Universe, Heavenly Father and Earthly Mother, we deeply thank you for your unconditional love and infinite blessings which allow us to sustain our precious gift of life every day, every moment. This afternoon we are gathered to come together here today at this 80th year memorial service for the late James Hatsuki Wakasa and all other Mitama spirits who die at the Topaz relocation camp. Many soldiers and all people young and old who died at all relocation camps. With sincerity in our heart, we humbly and gratefully offer this interfaith memorial service for our Mitama spirits, all of you who are given the gift of precious life on the earth. I am sure you are looking forward to fulfilling your life, yet you have to leave this physical world early. We express our condolence to your spirits. Today we are all gathered here to pray for you to find spiritual peace and happiness now and forever. Please accept our sincere prayers and feelings of deep care and compassion for all, all, all of you and had to endure and sacrifice. I, Reverend Kawahatsu, will perform a purification rite that will help us forgive others and purify all past negative emotions such as anger, fear, anxiety, and sadness. Let us this, this uh, purification right help our ancestors be at peace and uh, help all of us to move forward in harmony and with deep appreciation. We sincerely pray for your everlasting peace and happiness now and always. On this day, at this moment, we thank you. Thank you very much. Now I would like to ask all of you here today to join me in saying Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you very much. Ten time to Wakasa-san. All people who die at the camps and in the war zones for sacrificing their lives for all of us here today. Please join me, put the hand together and say Arigato gozaimasu. Send our compassion, love heart to all the spirits to sacrifice for us. Arigato gozaimasu. Arigato gozaimasu. Arigato gozaimasu. Arigato gozaimasu. 
。ありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。Thank you. We'll now have the offering of the tamakashi by our head officiant, Reverend Kawahatsu. I have the purification right on Sakyaji. Bow head receive the purification right. This symbolize purify uh, past our negative emotions, negative energies, express our feeling of anger, worries, scare, all the negative feelings. Purify to renew our heart and soul to go forward. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This concludes the purification service and rite. Um, let us join our hands four times together uh, to uh, continue our, our good uh, energy to Wakasa San, all the people that we lost um, during the war, and um, all the soldiers that served uh, for freedom. Haide. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Kawahatsu and Alice Kawahatsu. Our next speaker is Reverend Michael Yoshi. He is a retired United Methodist clergy in the California Nevada Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church. He is currently serving as the co-chair of the Friends of Wadi Fokin a partnership with a Palestinian Muslim village in the Bethlehem district of the West Bank. His father and grandfathers were in carceries in Topaz concentration camp. Thank you, Masa Cohen. Also to the uh, Wakasa committee for organizing today's event and also inviting me to participate uh, with you today. Thank you for your ongoing work of education and advocacy as well. And a special thank you to Sensei Kawahatsu for uh, the invocation of the ancestors and the purification ceremony. Uh, among them were my grandparents, uh, Seisuke and Misao Yoshi, who were incarcerated in Topaz, along with my father, who then was 21 years old. He's still alive at 101. Couldn't make it today, unfortunately. Um, but I think he's with us in spirit. Knowing that Mr. Wakasa was a Christian, it is an honor to represent our faith tradition today. While I had often told the story of Mr. Wakasa's killing in presentations I made to high school students many, many years ago, I had not known until the work of the Wakasa committee the many details that surrounded his killing. I was 
Surprised to learn that an estimated 2,000 persons, or nearly one quarter of the population of Topaz, gathered for his funeral the week following his, his death. It is indeed a testimony to the impact his death made upon the whole Topaz community, as well as a tribute to the Ise organizers who quickly assembled a funeral committee and made plans for the service, including six of the different clergy leadership on that day. Just imagine, if you would, the collective trauma, the grief, the sadness, the anger, and yes, even the outrage that was present among the people as they mourned the murder of one of their own. A solo rendition of the Christian hymn, Rock of Ages, was sung by a person named Kaoru Inoue. I invite you to step into the portal of time and imagine being there with the throngs of mourners as I sing these words. Imagine yourself amongst those 2,000 people who were present at that service. Chiro se no iwa yo Wagami o kakome Sakare shi waki no Chisi o to mizu ni Sumi no gegare mo you can imagine yourselves among the people there, knowing that Rock of Ages has often been sung for people of faith seeking refuge in God as their rock, for comfort and assurance, especially in times of suffering and hardship, and certainly during a time of mourning and grief. May we feel our social and spiritual solidarity with our ancestors who gathered 80 years ago to remember Wakasa's life. May we also feel into what they collectively felt on that particular day with their full range of human emotions. For we are spiritually bound together beyond the boundaries of time and space and we form community today, remembering this specific past while we commemorate this moment for the present context in which we are living. In the song, Rock of Ages, the words, let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed, refers to the blood of Christ that was splattered and spilled when he was crucified. Jesus was, in fact, the victim of a state-sanctioned killing. He was charged with a crime, and then he was executed upon a cross, when in reality he was only living out God's will for his life. This past weekend, our Christian community celebrated Easter, the day in which we remember the resurrection of Jesus, a day in which we remember that death can be spiritually transformed into new life, a day in which we affirm that God's love embodied in Jesus cannot be extinguished by hatred, violence, or even a brutal execution. Love always prevails. In a way, we are celebrating a spiritual resurrection of James Wakasa on this 80th anniversary of his murder. And like Jesus' crucifixion, Wakasa's murder was a state-sanctioned execution. He was accused of a crime of trying to escape from Topaz, while many of his neighbors attested to the fact that he was only out for his daily walk with his dog. Following the funeral, members of the community built a stone monument in his honor, but were ordered to destroy it. But instead of destroying it, they secretly buried it, hoping that a future generation would find it. The stone monument was their rock for the ages, buried in the earth, waiting to be excavated and resurrected for the truth of his story to be told.
day we gather both in mourning and in remembrance of the untimely death of James Atsuaki Wakasa, but we also gather in celebration of the resurrection of his spirit. To be in solidarity with him and all of our ancestors, we gather for a time of collective healing, a time of truth-telling, and a time for new life and new stories to be publicly proclaimed. I brought with me today a plate of rocks. You can't see them out there, but maybe our folks here can see them. And these uh, rocks were given to me by a man named Tad Fujita during the 80s, right in the middle of the Regis movement. And I was serving there at the Berkeley Methodist Church, and he saw my interest in topaz and in the other history of the camps. And he said, I want you to come over to my house and show you something. And he had this big collection of rocks. He said, I smuggled them from Topaz when I came home in 1945. Don't tell anybody that. But these rocks here witnessed everything that we experience. They're from the land that we lived on for those four years. These rocks tell their own stories when people themselves cannot. I brought these rocks here today to offer them for our speakers to hold, because I've often used these rocks as what I call speaking stones, so that we might be grounded in the land of Topaz and with rocks that witnessed all that took place with all of our ancestors, so that we may be grounded in the land there, but grounded in the stories that are yet to be told. And so I want to offer them to our esteemed speakers today. And pick one. Where's Nancy? And know that these rocks are alive as well as the stone monument that has been uncovered as well. I'll turn it back to Asako. Thank you, Reverend Joshi. And now, musician, poet, and educator, Louis Jordan, will perform Rock of Ages, a hymn played at James Hatsuaki Wakasa's funeral on April 19, 1943. More than 2,000 inmates attended. Thank <laughs> you. 
the archaeologists located the existence of the long-forgotten memorial stone erected when James Wakasa was murdered in Topaz 80 years ago. This was fantastic news to me, like the script of a Hollywood movie. A hand-drawn map is discovered by a researcher in the National Archives and printed in an obscure newsletter then Two archaeologists read the map, jump in their car, and drive from Southern California to the vast open Utah desert to the Topaz concentration campsite. And not only find the spot, but discover a piece of the stone sticking up from the ground. The Takahashi Foundation was the second organization to offer funding to the Topaz Museum for a dignified, ceremonious, archaeological excavation of the Wakasa stone. But instead, the stone was taken to the museum without any community consent. James Hatsuwaki Wakasa was not the only person killed by a guard in the concentration camps. But incidents like this are whitewashed in the government versions of life in the camps, as are the descriptions of tear gas and machine guns for crowd control. The Wakasa Memorial Stone is a concrete symbol of the atrocities and the threats our families lived under day and night which they tended to remain silent about in order to protect us from their fears. And it's also a symbol of the resilience of our ancestors because they did not destroy it as they were ordered to do 
They buried the stone and left us a map. And now it's been found. There is a thrill of victory in this. That's why we are here today, to honor the memory of Wakasa San and all the others who died in the camps or were killed fighting overseas. On the banners displayed in the plaza today are obituaries of the 140 people who died at Topaz and the 16 soldiers. These names may be found on the Wakasa Memorial website. We invite you to urge the Topaz Museum to arrange for the Wakasa Memorial Stone. And the camp concentration camp grounds, which have already been designated a National Historic Landmark, be put under the auspices of the National Park Service for professional oversight in perpetuity. The next speaker is Berkeley resident Patrick Hayashi. Patrick spent his career at the University of California. He retired as the associate president of the UC system. Since retiring 20 years ago, he has taken up art, singing, and more recently, bookbinding and puppetry. He was born in Topaz, and even though he doesn't remember anything about Topaz, it has affected his entire life. Seven. My mother told me the story of Jane Atsuaki Wakatsa. Every morning, every afternoon, he would take his dog for a long walk. One day his dog got caught on the barbed wire fence, and when Mr. Wakatsa tried to help his dog, a guard shot and killed him. At the time, I didn't understand why my mother told me this terrible story. Now, much later, I realized that she knew that I would grow up in a world filled with violence and racism. And this story was her way of helping me prepare and keeping me safe. This was the last story she told me. She had a rheumatic heart has just wore her out and she died very young. The first time I saw the monument that Nancy Ukai, Jeff Burton, and Mary Farrell found, I thought it was beautiful. On the outside, it is plain and simple, strong and solid, just like our parents and grandparents. But on the inside, it is rich, complex, and deep. My mother's spirit lives there. The monument embodies not just my mother's spirit, but the spirit of all the people who were imprisoned in Topaz. It contains the souls of everyone who died in Topaz. It protects the souls of 16 young men who volunteered to fight for America and who fought and who fell at Anzil, Salerno, Monte Cassino. It holds the proud spirit of the Issei landscapers who built this monument. Government, government authorities in Topaz and in Washington ordered them to destroy the monument. But they defied those orders and buried it instead so that future generations, so that we could find it. After it was found, the National Park Service convened community leaders, archaeologists, and historians to, to discuss what to do with the monument. They all understood that Mr. Lacoste's monument 
is the single most important object ever found at Hope House or any other Japanese American concentration camp. His monument changes the narrative of the concentration camps in a fundamental way. The camps were not safe, benign places were treated, where people were treated humanely. Yes, there were dances and baseball games, but the shot that killed Mr. Wakasa was a tenth shot fired at Topaz. And even after he was killed, guards continued to fire more shots at other prisoners. People were terrorized by the cruel, cold-blooded behavior of the guards. But the Issei and the Nisei did not passively accept their imprisonment. Mr. Wakasa's monument, the 2,000 people who attended his funeral, the hundreds of paper flowers women folded to comfort his spirit, show that the Issei and the Nisei were proud defiant and courageous. Because Mr. Wakasa's monument is so important historically and spiritually, everyone agreed that it should be left in the ground. Everyone agreed that it should not be touched until a, co a comprehensive conservation plan could de be developed by the Japanese American community in consultation with experts on historical pre pre preservation. Masako's family, family foundation offered to pay all the costs related to the careful excavation and preservation of Mr. Wakasa's monument. However, in an act that defied logic and basic human decency, Topaz Museum Director Jane Beckwith directed a heavy equipment operator to take a forklift and a chain and tear the monument from the ground. In the process, the monument was cracked and the hallowed ground, the sacred place, where Mr. Wakasa's soul had rested in peace for 77 years was desecrated. There were no archeologists, no historians, no Japanese Americans were there to make sure that Mr. Wakasa's monument and his soul were treated with respect. Stanford archaeologist Ian Hodder has said that a sacred object, when it is taken from the earth, can have the power to unite a community or to tear it apart. The Wakasa monument has been both. It has created, created deep divisions within the Japanese American community. Jane Beck was said that she pulled up the monument to keep it safe from vandals. This makes no sense whatsoever. Only a small portion of the monument was visible and it could easily have been concealed with a few scoops of dirt. And even if they had found it, what could vandals have done to a 2,000 pound stone that was almost completely buried in the ground? Spit on it, spray paint it, shoot it. The people who ripped out the monument did much more damage with their forklift and chain than any vandals could possibly have done. Yes, the monument has divided our community, but it has also created strong, unbreakable bonds of friendship. The 2,000 people who attended Mr. Wakasa's funeral were comforted by the words, Rock of Ages, 
cleft for me. And today, 80 years later, we are comforted by Lewis Jordan's haunting rendition of this beautiful hymn. Lewis's music inspires us to continue the work the Issei landscapers began 80 years ago. We vow that Mr. Wakasa's life and death will be forever remembered. And today, we come together to help each other heal. These stones that were brought from Topaz help us open our hearts and begin the long process of forgiveness. To forgive those who dishonored our beautiful sacred monument. And as we open our hearts, we create what Dr. Martin Luther King calls a beloved community. Together, in our beloved community, we bear witness to an injustice done to a single human being that represents the injustice done to us all. Today, we pledge to fight together to make sure that what happened to Mr. Wakasa will never happen again. Not to us, not to our community, not to anyone. Thank you, Patrick. We are deeply indebted to the work of Mary Farrell and Jeff Burton. Their discovery has brought us here today. Mary Farrell is an archeologist who for 30 years has worked with her husband Jeff Burton to document the archeological remains at sites related to the mass incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. You may know their work if you've ever visited Manzanar in Southern California. In September of 2020, using a map Nancy Ukai found in the National Archives, Mary and Jeff located the nearly buried stone that Issei at Topaz had erected to honor Mr. Wakasa. Mary is one of my heroes and she has told us that she's willing to stay a few minutes extra if you want to take selfies with her. <laughs> I'm really honored to be with you all here today to honor Mr. Wakasa. We know from the research that Nancy Ukai has done that his friends wanted to commemorate him too. And um, so, as has been described already, they asked permission to put in a memorial at the spot where he was killed. They were refused. They did it anyway. And the commotion that that caused went all the way to Washington, D.C where the military wrote, it is totally inappropriate to have a monument to somebody who was killed as part of a justified military action. So uh, the administration at Topaz had to make sure it was demolished and they wrote to Washington and tell them, yes, it was demolished. So as has been described, um, Thanks to a map that Nancy had found, we knew where he was killed, and so we thought we can go there and see if there's some fragment left, like a, you know, like a little piece of concrete or a cobble or maybe a slight depression in the ground where the memorial had been. And so when we went there, we were astonished to see a huge rock. There was some concrete too, but there was a huge rock, almost completely buried. You could hardly see it. it that area had been surveyed by archaeologists before, and nobody noticed it because he didn't have the map. Um, so we could see why the military didn't want this monument there. It has a lot to say. It had a lot to say then, it has a lot to say now. It says that the conditions were not so benign in 
pleasant in the camps as, as what the uh, official narrative would say. It, uh, it commemorates Mr. Okasa and all those. It, it commemorates him as an important person. His murder should be remembered. And uh, the fact that the, the Topaz, other Topaz prisoners weren't accepting the official narrative of what had happened to him, that it was a so-called justified military action. So people have asked me if this is the most important artifact that has been found at the 10 concentration camps. And uh, I, think, I think Pat Hayashi makes a pretty good case. But I can tell you that it's the most important artifact that Jeff and I have ever found at any site, anywhere. It not only commemorates Mr. Wakasa and the 120,000 other innocent people who were unjustly incarcerated, it commemorates all those who were, who died while being incarcerated, and all those who fought for our country while their families were being incarcerated. But I don't think the stone is only about defiance and loss. I think it also speaks of hope for the future. And that's because those Issei went to a whole lot of trouble to make sure that we would find that stone in the future. And so that we would remember Mr. Wakasa, and here we are, remembering Mr. Wakasa. So um, I'm grateful to them for their hope. I'm grateful to the Japanese American community for having faith that with some pushing and prodding against injustice and lies, we can live up to our Constitution. I'm always so impressed by the Japanese American community is so often transforms that historic trauma into advocacy and support for other groups that are being uh, experiencing racism and violence. Okay, there's one more thing I want to say. Um, I would ask you to consider asking the National Park Service to sponsor a community archaeology project at Topaz. Mr. Wakasa's stone tells us there's a lot more there than what we knew about, what we expected. And community archaeology can be a way for people to come together. And uh, survivors and descendants and uh, high school kids, Delta residents, can all work together to document the features and artifacts that are left at that site. Jeff and I have found that uh, it's a lot easier to talk about difficult issues like racism when you're looking at a small, tangible object like, say, a baby bottle or a, a child's toy at a prison camp. It speaks volumes about the cruelty and absurdity of the incarceration. Uh, archaeology is very slow. You've seen archaeologists with their trowels and brushes. And they have to document every marble, every button, even every nail, measure it, ph photograph it, catalog it. Um, and you get to work outside in the heat and the cold and the wind, and that gives you a little hint of what it might have been like to, to live at Topaz. Um, but there's just something Pat Hayashi wrote to me that I think is so cool. He said that community archaeology can be a metaphor for how we should look at our history. And I'm quoting him here. Look respectfully, get dirty, be meticulous, honor every object, Treat the soil as hallowed ground. Ask questions, look deeper and deeper again. I think Mr. Wakasa and his friends would tell us, don't accept the official government narrative before you look deeper. Work together, do what needs to be done. Jeff and I want to thank you all for letting us come along on your quest for truth and justice and healing. There you got to it. Thank you, Mary. We are grateful for the work you and your husband, Jeff Burton, do for our community. Nancy Ukai, you've heard her name a lot already, is a Topaz descendant whose research on James Wakasa led the archaeologists to rediscover the Wakasa monument for us. She recently returned from a trip to Japan 
to Mr. Wakasa's birthplace to learn about his life. She's a founding member of the Wakasa Memorial Committee, Tutu for Solidarity, and was past co-president of the Berkeley JACL. She is chair of the Nichi Bay Foundation. Maybe Nancy will stay and get have her selfies too. I hope we can all get a group picture together because it's very moving to see you all here. Thank you for standing. Um, you know, people stood, 2,000 people stood at Mr. Wilcox's funeral. And I was just talking to Dr. Karen Korematsu, who of course is a Topaz descendant and the daughter of national civil rights hero, um, Fred Korematsu. And she reminded that he said, when you see something wrong, don't be afraid to speak up and stand up for what's right. So I'm only gonna keep you standing for one more minute, but I wanted to tell you that I was in Japan for three weeks um, last month with my husband, and we went looking for a relative of Mr. Wakasa, so we could invite them to be here with us today, or a photograph, because the only photograph we have of Mr. Wakasa is his casket at his funeral. Unfortunately, we were not able to find a descendant, a relative, or a photograph. However, and the paper trail is thin, but what we do have is 2,000 pounds of evidence that his life mattered, he existed, people loved him, and people were outraged at his murder. So Mr. Wakasa was born in 1880, and it was, it's, it's hard to go to a strange place and just show up and say, do you know any relatives, right? 1880 is 15 years after the Civil War ended. It's two years before the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed. And it was eight years before my grandfather, Tokutaro Takayanagi, was born in Shizuoka, Japan. So what did happen was the stone brought us together, as it has today. And I met people in Wakasa's hometown. And I, they made paper flowers. They folded origami, children folded origami paper dogs. And we will bring those to Utah in 10 days. They also gave rocks to me to give to you. And I thank um, Reverend Yoshi for giving us these talking stones to share because stones have symbolic and material importance to the Japanese. And they are a symbol of connection. They of course represent time. And that's why when something is done that doesn't respect the integrity and sacredness of the stone, that act is profane. So today, um, we'll end by saying that in um, Utah, in 10 days, we've requested the Wakasa Memorial Committee that part of the ceremony be not only to walk from his barrack and retrace his steps to the spot where he died. The only reason we know of that spot is because of that monument and because of the people who defied government authority to erect it and then were forced to bury it. In the afternoon, we have asked to have a procession to the Wakasa Monument, which is still sitting on a construction pallet, the carpet sample, it's in the back courtyard, and we will touch it. And through touching it, we will, in the words of the poet, Yonsei poet Brandon Shimoda, this act of touching the Wakasa stone will be our hands touching, however lightly, however briefly, the hands of the Issei. And now that we've established connection with the people in Mr. Wakasa's hometown in Ishikawa Prefecture, we now have a connection across time and across space with people whom we were with at war with 80 years ago. And so his legacy will be to bring us together and to bring nations together and to bring children of Delta and with Ishikawa Prefecture Shikamachi together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy. So many people helped put this event together. In gratitude, we'd like to thank Serena Lau from the San Francisco Recreation and Parks, Kenji Taguma, Nichi Bay Foundation, Paul Osaki and Diane Tsuchida of the Japanese Community and Cultural Center of Northern California, Rosalind Tonai, National Japanese American Historical Society, Jonathan Cordero, for the Indigenous Land Acknowledgement. Hiroshi Shimizu, Tuli Lake Committee, the Henry and Tomoe Charitable Foundation, the participants who gave of their time and support, 
the Wakasa Memorial Committee. Those here and in Japan who sent folded flowers, tsuru, and origami dogs. And to all of the volunteers who worked tirelessly to make this happen, in gratitude and in solidarity, we thank you. At Ma Mr. Wakasa's funeral 80 years ago, there were no fresh flowers. Camp inmates made paper flower wreaths. We now invite survivors of the camps to make a paper flower offering. During the offerings, Louis Jordan will play a song entitled, I Want to Talk About You. This concludes our program. We're going to offer flowers now. I have to put down the microphone to do so. We're offering this to survivors of any camp. Thank you for coming to this memorial on this auspicious anniversary.
that they want to take care of you. Thanks, Brenda.
I, I actually have to do this.